so quadratic equations before i talk about quadratic equations i would like to comment upon i would like to comment upon the general difference between equation and identity okay so what is the difference between an identity and an equation so identity versus equation who will tell me the difference what is the difference between an identity and an equation I think this was something which I I talked about during the bridge course also. Yes, Ashintya, I think uh, offline, online, whatever is the issue. If it is offline, we'll be coming to your school campus. Okay, uh, three three fifteen. I normally we normally reach the school campus and we run the class till seven seven fifteen in the premises only. Okay. If it is online, because see, uh, online offline, the uh, you no know, this thing is actually. uh slightly shaky right now is your school started offline i mean are you having your semester exams offline no i think you you told me it's happening uh, on through online exam.net okay so depending upon whatever is the situation if it is offline we will be there in your school campus if it is online then how it is continuing but mostly 90% chances that it should convert to offline okay yes exactly so identity is what identity is basically a equality relation between two expressions equality relation between two expressions between two expressions two expressions that holds that holds true for almost all values of the variables let me write all values of the variable or variables okay under the subject to the validity of the expression subject to the to the validity vali what happened to my spelling today so today i'm sad that last class of 11th and i'm not going to see you for the next one month oh sorry not see you <laughs> have classes with you subject to the validity of the expressions okay now see i have used a very very interesting word i have not used the word equation i have used some kind of an equality relation between two expressions between two expressions that hold true for almost all values almost all values means it might not be all values but let's say it can be true for all the values and why almost not all values because it is subjected to the validity of the expression see example is let's say if i say sin square x plus cos square x is equal to 1 this is a this is identity why because it is going to work for all the values of x and in fact all real values of x correct now in international books they normally write it with triple dash over here showing that these two are actually equivalent relations that means both of them are stating the same same things okay left hand side is also one right hand side is also one okay but if i talk about something like this tan square x plus 1 is secant square x okay acha uh, i am putting the three dashes here don't think that you know your, your books are also going to do the same okay this is i am just trying to copy the uh, symbols that is used by international books okay this is true for all values of x provided it should not be an odd multiple of pi by 2 right so so identity doesn't mean it's going to be true for all the values of the variable they are true for almost all the values but subject to the fact that the functions given to you or the expressions given to you should be should be should be real and defined right so don't start putting it putting into that expression anything that you want you know under the name that it's an identity okay <laughs> all right so what's an equation on the other hand so this is an identity my dear this is an identity so what's the equation on the other hand equation on the other hand is basically the same concept is just that they are true i'll i, I, I might not write everything down but they will be true da 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 let me write it in white yeah they will be true for 
certain values of the variable certain values of the variable or variables okay which are called the roots okay so these are called the roots of that equation okay of course again subject to the fact that it makes the expression a valid one that means the expression should be real and defined okay now long long back ago uh, see today we are doing quadratic equation quadratic equation is a type of polynomial equation isn't it cubic equation biquadratic equation pentic equation these are all examples of polynomial equation so long long time ago there was a german mathematician called karl frederick gauss okay gauss you would have heard he gave a very important theorem in mathematics which is actually called the fundamental theorem of algebra and karl frederick gauss in his fundamental theorem of algebra stated that any polynomial equation of degree n will have exactly n roots whether real or non real that's a different thing but it cannot have more or it cannot have less if it has less means there is some repetition in the roots happening for example if a quadratic equation if i talk about it's a degree 2 polynomial equation so it will have two roots now both the roots can be same also like 1 1 let's say x minus 1 whole square equal to 0 there is only one root which is 1 but he said it is a repeated root so there will be two roots which will be 1 1 okay if let's say if i talk about x square plus x plus 1 equal to 0 it will have two complex roots omega and omega square but two only will be having it will not be having more than that it will not be having less than that okay and this particular theorem given by gauss is not violated that is why that is why it is called the fundamental theorem it's not going to be get violated okay so when i talk about an equation okay let's say i give you a very surprising equation please consider this interesting example please consider this ex interesting example okay so let me give you a equation to you x minus a x minus b by c minus a c minus b x minus a x minus c by b minus a b minus c and x minus b x minus c by a minus b a minus c equal to let's say 1 Or let's say minus one equal to zero. Okay. Now, uh, if you look this, look at this ex this equation prima facie, and of course, see uh, your a, b, and c should be all distinct. Why? Because if any two of them are equal, your denominators are going to become zero, which you don't want to happen because it will make the expression undefined. So here, if you see prima facie, this looks like a quadratic equation. So people who will look at it will say, this seems to be a quadratic equation, isn't it? Isn't it? Doesn't it look like a quadratic equation? This is a quadratic term. This is a quadratic term. This is a quadratic term. Okay, so overall, it's a quadratic equation, right? So as per fundamental theorem of algebra, it should have two roots, not more than that. Okay, so now I'll give you a surprise here. Try to check by putting x equal to a. Does it satisfy the equation? Does it satisfy the equation? Let me call this as E equation. Does it satisfy E? Yes, it satisfies E. Correct. Okay. Now try putting x as b. Does it satisfy the equation? Put b in place of x and check. Is it satisfying the equation? Yes, it will satisfy. Very good. Chalo. Put C. Does it satisfy the equation? <laughs> And to our surprise, it does. Now, how is this happening? Because it is supposed to be prima facie a quadratic equation, and it is showing me three roots. Are you Rama? Why? <laughs> how is it possible? Now, one part of the definition I did not tell you. he added that if let's say a polynomial equation of degree n shows more than n roots then that polynomial equation actually becomes an identity in the other words that particular equation will not have only two or three or four roots it will have infinitely many roots possible so that will become an identity 
so right now many of you got deceived because actually i wrote an identity in a very camouflaged way in a very discreet way that nobody was able to identify you know what i wrote actually so you'll be surprised to know i wrote something like this 0x square 0x plus 1 minus 1 equal to 0 <laughs> so this equation is actually this and it could work it would work for any value of x that you want to put it will not only work for a b c you put anything inside it will work okay so what i gave you was actually an identity so this becomes this is actually was a identity in disguise okay so when we are trying to look at any uh, equation let's say a polynomial equation many a times uh, the question setter would have actually given us an identity in the shape of a quadratic okay so how do we identify whether a given equation a polynomial equation is an identity or not right so in that case please understand you just look at the coefficients present to the left and the right ideally all of them should be 0 0 each if the right side is 0 ideally all the coefficients should be 0 okay that is why these equations will work for any input you provide to them so whether you put a here or a b here or a c here or any other value it's going to become a zero because there is a zero sitting in front of it and of course this will ultimately also become a zero okay that's why zero is equal to zero is happening which is a universal truth okay so now i'll give you an example i sorry not example a question based on the identity to crack okay so let me give you a simple question question is this particular equation this particular equation has or is satisfied by is satisfied by by more than two values of x more than two values of of x okay find the find the value or values of lambda find the value or values of lambda okay simple question based on you know the theory that we covered in the previous slide i'm sure everybody can answer this so this has more than two satisfied by more than two values of x Yes, done. Excellent. Satya, very good. Eh? <laughs> Arshita. Okay, now see, everybody, please pay attention. So, as per the prime of SE, you know, uh, equation, as it appears to me in the first glance, so for my prime of SE experience of this equation, I can see that it's a quadratic. So as per Carl Frederick Gauss fundamental theorem of algebra, it should have exactly two values of X, which should be satisfying it. But the question setter has given it is satisfied by more than two values, which means this actually equation must be an identity. And if it is an identity, no matter whatever X you put, okay, it should always be giving you a zero on the right side. And this can always only happen when the coefficients are becoming zero together. That means the coefficient of x square x and the constants, they are simultaneously zero. So what we have to do is we have to take the intersection of the values of Lambda, which we get by solving these three, that value is going to be the value that will make this an identity, which will make it, you know, you can say immune to any value of X you put, it's just going to give you zero every time. Okay. So everybody knows that this is factorizable as this which is nothing but two and three. Okay. 
this is satisfied for one and two, or you can say two and one. And this is also satisfied for two and minus two. So out of these, you'll see that two is a value which is common to all of them. Yeah. So if you choose a Lambda value as two, it will make everything zero simultaneously. So the, the value of Lambda is actually a two here. So this is your answer for this question. Is it fine? Okay. If you put a one, see one will make only the second one zero. <laughs> the first one still will be dependent on your, the first one will still give you a value, which is dependent on X. Okay. And obviously the constant term will also become a minus three. So it did not be zero for all values of X. So if it is an identity, it is going to be true for all values of X, not only, you know, three or four or five or six, it will be true for so many values. Okay. So if it is not an identity, if it is an equation, it should have exactly n roots. And if it is having more than n roots, it definitely becomes an identity. There is nothing in between, right? It cannot happen. Like, sir, is it possible that it'll have seven roots exactly being a quadratic equation? No, either two or infinitely many, nothing in between. Is it fine? Okay. Now coming to a equation and in fact, a quadratic equation, everybody is aware. What's a quadratic equation. I had a brief discussion about it in the bridge course as well. So equation of this nature, a X square plus B X plus C equal to zero, where a B C could be complex numbers. Now, when I say complex numbers, it will also include real numbers into it. Okay. Proof for. <laughs> Uh, I'll definitely send you one if I find it. <laughs> okay. But mostly they state the theorem like this, even in Olympiad books, if you see, they'll just state the theorem, but I, I will check for that. I'll check, I'll, check, uh, I'll just check the higher uh, algebra books and find the proof if at all is there. Okay. Now in a quadratic equation, please understand a cannot be zero because if a is zero, it will actually become a linear equation. Now we normally categorize quadratic equation as two types. Uh, one, which is called a pure quadratic equation. Okay. What's a pure quadratic equation? A pure quadratic equation is where your B is zero. So a should not be zero B is zero and C could be anything. Okay. C could be any complex number. Second type is called an affected quadratic equation affected a name given to it. There is nothing uh, very important about it. It's not like the J people will ask you what are the types of quadratic equation, but just for your general you know, knowledge. So here B and A and B are not zero. C could be any, any complex number. Okay. So we'll talk about pure quadratic equation in our uh, upcoming academic year, where we'll be discussing a few types of quadratic equations, uh, sorry, few types of uh, integration problems involving pure quadratic expressions. Okay. Anyways. So. Let's talk about roots and nature of roots of a quadratic, a quadratic equation. Okay. Now I know many of you would be saying, I already know this. I already know the Shridhar Acharya formula, but I would be trying to put in some geometrical, you know, analysis also into this, which actually I covered in the bridge course. So I'll be slightly going at a faster rate. If I talk about a quadratic equation, sorry, if I talk about a quadratic equation, a quadratic equation basically gives you some values of X, right? Which satisfy this particular quadratic equation. Okay. So this gives you some roots, right? Now these roots are basically nothing, but they are points of intersection. They are points of intersection of these two curves. Y equal to a X square plus B X plus C and y equal to zero, which happens to be your X axis. Okay. So when you're trying to solve this equation, it is like asking yourself, where are these two curves actually intersecting? Okay. The points of intersection is what we call as the roots of the quadratic equation. Now this particular expression is a familiar term to you because you have already done parabola chapter in quite depth. So this is basically a, this is basically going to be a parabolic curve. Okay. So this is a parabolic curve or a parabola. You can call it not parabolic. Let's call it as a parabola. Okay. Now this parabola has 
okay has its axis parallel to the y axis correct we are already aware of this so such kind of a parabola will have their axis parallel to the y axis if it was x equal to a quadratic in y it would have been a parabola whose axis was parallel to the x axis okay i hope this is not a news to you you are already aware from the parabola chapter now a is a very important uh, you know term over here which we call as the leading coefficient so a basically decides the concavity of this parabola so if a is positive then your parabola will be opening upwards okay having its axis parallel to the y axis but opening upwards okay you are already aware of this if a is negative it will be a parabola which will be opening downwards okay so what i'm going to do here is okay i'm going to i'm going to start with the parabola equation and uh, y equal to 0 i will substitute it at certain stage so let me just begin with the equation of this parabola i want to show you something very interesting okay so let's start with y equal to ax square plus bx plus c okay so here what i'm going to do i'm going to just complete a bit of square over here like this so a times x plus b by 2a the whole square minus b square by 4a square plus c okay on opening the brackets you will end up getting something like this correct or you can write it in a much refined way as this minus b square minus 4ac by 4a okay all of you please look at this expression now here in this expression i will now substitute the y as 0 okay just to make just to find out the points where it is intersecting the x axis so when you put y as 0 you will end up getting a situation like this okay by the way uh, if you permit me i can write this term as a d okay where d is your expression b square minus 4ac now why it is given a special treatment why are we calling it as by a different name it is basically the discriminant of the quadratic equation and i will talk about the discriminant in some time how it is useful so when you take the d to the other side in fact let me rewrite it like this it becomes something like this so if you bring this a down it becomes d by 4a square take the under root on both the sides will give you plus minus root d by 2 mod a now remember mod a becomes irrelevant for us because there is a plus and minus both sitting over here so we don't write actually a mod a we just write it as an a right because even if a is positive or negative it has to undergo both the plus minus scenarios isn't it so from here you get x value as minus b by 2a plus minus root d by 2a okay yes or no and this gives us the two roots the two roots as minus b by 2 in fact minus b plus let me side with the minus yeah this is one root and this is another root minus b plus root d by 2a okay so two roots come out from this but this is something which we are you were already aware of okay and this formula that you have seen here this formula is actually called as the quadratic equation formula or the shridhar acharya formula right quadratic equation or shridhar acharya formula okay now i will show you something related to the graphical aspects of it also yeah sorry lot of drilling noise was coming here now uh, here i would like to connect this thing with the the, uh, the vertex of the parabola so how is the vertex of the parabola very important but before i proceed towards that 
let's analyze this formula let's analyze the quadratic equation formula analysis of shridhar acharya formula acharya formula so when we talk about this equation minus b plus minus root d which is b square minus 4 ac by 2a okay when we talk about this formula this term b square minus 4 ac which we call as the discriminant by the way many people call it as determinant <laughs> it is actually discriminant discriminant is something which helps you to discriminate between the nature of the roots so three situations arise if your discriminant is positive we say that the roots these are your roots the roots are real and distinct the roots are real and distinct okay now how do we how do we infer this from our graph now all of you please focus on these two graphs which i am going to show you on the screen right now okay so i am going to make the graph of ax square plus bx plus c equal to y for two cases one case is where your a is positive so if a is positive your graph will be opening upwards like this correct and when your a is negative your graph will be opening downwards like this correct now we know that the points where it is meeting the x axis those are called the roots of the quadratic equation correct so these are the roots of the quadratic equation okay now this condition that you have on your screen when d is greater than 0 you get real and distinct roots how is it associated with this graph now let us understand that this vertex this vertex is basically a point whose coordinates is minus d by 2a comma minus d by 4a now how how is it that and you will be surprised that even for this also the expression is the same so it doesn't depend on a whether whether a is positive or negative your vertex is still that minus b by 2a comma minus d by 4a always now how do i get the how did i get this coordinate see to get this coordinate i'll go back to the previous slide that we had discussed here at this stage if you realize at this stage if you realize let me write a d for this yeah now all of you please pay attention when your parabola is opening downward uh, opening upwards your vertex position is where your y is minimum isn't it so if you want this expression to be minimum minimum least what are you going to do so here if you see this guy is the only guy which is changing this is fixed this is fixed and this is the variable guy okay and that to this variable is always greater than equal to 0 so if you want your y to be the least what would you do you say i will put this variable to be the least value so that you know i whatever i get is a least value of the entire expression because the second guy is anyways fixed it's not going to change so you're going to put your x value as minus b by 2a in order to make it the least which is zero so for that you have to make your x value as minus b by 2a and when you do that this entire term will go for a toss and you will be left with minus d by 4a as your y value and this actually becomes your coordinates of the vertex of the parabola okay this is already known to you right now what happens if your parabola was opening downwards why didn't the vertex coordinates change in this case in this case vertex is a point where your y coordinate is the maximum possible value right now here the situation will slightly change here this is variable but this variable will now be lesser than equal to 0 why because a is negative if a is negative and this is a perfect square the whole thing is going to be a negative quantity right so this fellow the first guy is reducing the value of the entire expression isn't it so if i ask you a simple question what would you do to that variable so that the value is maximum what will you do you will say sir the guy which is reducing the value i will make it zero so that it doesn't further reduce my value so for that to happen x will be again minus b by 2a and y will be again minus d by 4a so that's the reason why the vertex coordinate irrespective of whether the parabola is opening upwards or opening downwards remains the same okay so that is what i have written over here okay now see 
if you want your roots to be real and distinct that means you want the parabola to cut the x axis correct so when your a is positive should your vertex be below the x axis or above the x axis or on the x axis what will you do what will you say you will say sir it has to be below the x axis then only the branches will go and cut the x axis correct so if it is hanging like this it will not get the x axis no so no real roots will be generated or if it is touching only and going again you will say no real roots will be generated so the diagram which i have shown you that is the exact scenario that should happen if you want your roots to be real and distinct right so for this your y coordinate of the discriminant should be negative correct that means minus d by 4a should be less than 0 that means minus d should be less than 0 because 4a you can take it to the other side without affecting the inequality correct so that means your d should be greater than 0 and this is what i had written over here so when your d is greater than 0 your roots will be real and distinct so that is further supported by your vertex i mean the graph of the parabola using that vertex coordinate are you getting my point what i am trying to say so if somebody asks you can you justify why discriminant greater than 0 is required for you to have real and distinct roots graphically graphically then this is the justification for it getting the point similarly we also know from the shridhar acharya formula that if d is 0 the roots will be real and equal the roots are roots are real and equal okay roots are real and equal is basically a scenario where your graph is going to acha many people ask me this question sir what about this case what about this case so for if a is negative does the same situation d greater than 0 hold for real and distinct roots yes the same condition will hold true see how in this case your minus d by 4a should be positive why because if you want your graph to cut the x axis at two places your vertex should be above the x axis if your a is negative right which means minus d should be less than 0 why because 4a will be negative quantity 4a is a negative quantity correct yes or no so if you take the 4a to the other side your inequality will swap or will flip so that means d should be again greater than 0 okay so it doesn't matter it actually doesn't matter whether your a is positive or negative your discriminant should be greater than 0 to get real and distinct roots irrespective of whatever is your sign of a okay so this a d greater than 0 is a condition which is going to be universally valid for both the situations okay now when you talk about real and equal roots your discriminant should be equal to 0 does the graph justify it yes it does why see if you want your equation to have real and equal roots your vertex should just touch the x axis so if your vertex just touches the x axis please note your discrim your minus d by 4a should be zero which means d should be zero correct and from here we can actually know what's your roots also because this point is your minus b by 2a so it will have real and equal roots and each one will be equal to each one will be equal to each equal to minus b by 2a okay so please make a note of this and this situation doesn't change even if the parabola was opening downwards the same situation will be valid here as well okay so we'll go and just touch the x axis like this thereby the vertex will have a y coordinate which is equal to 0 okay so this will be 0 and hence d will be 0 is it fine any questions any concerns here the third situation is where your discriminant is less than 0 discriminant is less than 0 means your roots are roots are non real in nature in fact i would say roots are complex in nature roots are complex in nature complex in nature means it will not be appearing to touch the x axis so let's say i take these two scenarios so when your roots are complex it may be hanging up in the air like this okay or hanging down like this so you will not see a visual cutting happening of the x axis with the parabola okay so in such situations what will you say you will say 
the the vertex of the parabola should be positive in the case where a is greater than zero. That means minus d by four a should be positive, which means minus d should be positive, which means d is negative, right? In our case, where a is negative, this discriminant, uh, sorry, this uh, vertex should be having a y coordinate which is negative, correct? So minus d by four a should be negative in this case. Which means minus d should be positive because four a is negative, isn't it? If four a is negative and if you multiply throughout with four a, your inequality sign will switch. Which means d should be again less than zero. So same condition will arise here also. Okay. So your discriminant should be negative if you want your roots to be complex. And please note, please note that these roots will be complex conjugates of each other. So if one root is, let's say P plus I Q, then the other root, if one is P plus I Q, then the other root will be P minus I Q for sure. If your coefficients of the quadratic equation, they are all real in nature. I will talk about this little later on. Okay. First of all, this, this concept is clear to you that how vertex plays a very critical role in understanding the, the nature of the roots. Is it fine? Any questions, any concerns here, anybody has. So graphically also we have understood it. Mathematic, mathematically, we already knew since our class 10th days. Okay. Any questions, any concerns? All right. If there's no question, no concerns. We'll talk about, we'll talk about some important points. The first thing that I would like to discuss here is that if A, B, C are all real number, when I say real means purely real. Okay. Uh, no, no, uh, non-real part should be there with it. So, okay. Purely real. Okay. And if one of the roots, roots of the quadratic equation is P plus IQ, okay, then the other root must be, a root must be P minus IQ, okay. Now, why it is basically happening like this? See, very simple. Uh, let's say if one of the roots is one root is P plus IQ. Okay. And let's say for the sake of generality, I take the other root to be um, maybe uh, what should I take? Give me some two variables X plus I Y. <laughs> no X. I don't want to use uh, 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 alpha plus I beta. Also, I don't want to use. R O R very good. R plus I S. <laughs> Thank you. So let's say I use R plus I S. Okay. Now there's a very important relation that you would have already learned in class 10 that is called the beta's relation. So by from beta's relation, I'll talk about this also from beta's relation, beta V capital from beta's relation. We know that the sum of the roots the sum of the roots should be minus B by A. Okay. Now remember if A, B, C are all real number, this is a completely real number. That means I can safely say it is minus B by A plus zero I. Correct. Now if I group up the terms here as per our complex number algebra, what I realize is that Q plus S should be zero, which means your S should be minus of Q. Okay. Achha, by the way, here, when I'm assuming that the root is P plus IQ, I'm assuming it under the fact that Q is not zero. That means I'm saying one of the root is actually having a non real part with it or imaginary part with it. Okay. So your S is actually minus Q in this case, right? Which makes our root. So the other root is actually now the, the other root actually now becomes R minus IQ, isn't it? Okay. Now we also know from beta's relation 
that the product of the roots, the product of the roots is C by A, isn't it? Okay, right. We also know this. Now here also C and A both are real number, so I can say it doesn't have an imaginary part. So I'll put a zero I next to it. So now again, pull out the imaginary part and equate it to zero because right hand side we have the imaginary part as zero. So there will be some real part. I'm not worried about it. But what will be the imaginary part on the left side? Okay, let's try to equate it to zero. So this will be minus P Q plus Q R, right? And there is something over here which I am not interested in. So can I say from here that P Q should be equal to Q R, correct? And since Q is not equal to zero, can I say R is equal to P? That means the same root will now become. So this will now be transformed to P minus I Q, right? Thereby signifying that the other root should be the complex conjugate of the given root. Okay. But this is only to be used, my dear, if your coefficients of the quadratic equation are all real. This is a very, very important criteria. If any one of the coefficient is non-real in nature, you cannot claim this. You cannot claim that if one root is two plus three i, other will be two minus three i, or if one root is three minus four i, other will be three plus four i, unless until the coefficients of the quadratic equation are purely real quantities. Is it fine? Any questions here? Okay. Uh, anybody wants to write this down? Please do so. Else, I will move on to the next important point to be noted. Done. Okay. Second point to be noted is that. If A, B, C are all rational quantities, okay, and one of the roots, one of the roots of the quadratic equation is irrational, is irrational, okay, then the other root, then the other root must be. The rationalizing factor of the given root. Okay, that means to say, if one root is p plus root q, okay, where root q is a this is a third, okay, then the other root will be p minus root q. Are you getting my point? Now, why is this happened? Because again, you want the sum to be rational. Because sum will be, sum will be minus b by a, and b and a are all rational numbers. So sum will be rational, product will be rational. So if sum and product both are rational, it can only happen when the two roots themselves are rationalizing factors of each other. Because on adding, the third will get cancelled, and on multiplying, the third will get squared up. Are you getting my point? Okay. So very very important. So if you realize that your coefficients are all rational, this is rational, okay. And one of the root is let's say two minus root three, the other will become two plus root three by default. Is this fine? Okay. The third thing that I would like is actually the Vita's relation, which you are already aware, but uh, I will like to talk about it a little bit more. See, Vita's relation is basically a relation which relates. The coefficients of any polynomial equation with its roots. Again, I'll repeat. It's a relation which relates coefficients of any polynomial equation with the roots of the polynomial equation. So let's say if you have a polynomial equation of this nature. Okay, any polynomial equation. And when I say polynomial equation, your <laughs> A not A one etc. They can all be complex numbers. Okay, so don't be like they have to be real, purely real. No, not necessarily. They can be complex also. So Vita's relation will work even for those polynomial equations where the coefficients are complex in nature, need not be real. Okay, so Vita, an Italian mathematician, he figured out that if this particular equation has roots alpha one, alpha two till alpha n, let's say, then 
the sum of the roots which i will write it as summation alpha 1 will be minus a1 by a0 okay so if this equation has got these many roots alpha 1 alpha 2 now again alpha 1 alpha 2 all of them need not be real some of them may be complex also and product of two root at a time will be my plus a2 by a0 product three at a time will be minus a3 by a0 okay so in general he said so in general he said that if you take the sum of product k at a time, okay, this sum will be minus one to the power k, a k by a naught. Now this actually comes from a very simple fact that many people ask me, sir, is there any proof for this? The proof is just you writing this expression like this, a naught x minus alpha one, x minus alpha two, da 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 da, x minus alpha n, and just compare. <clears throat> compare coefficients of coefficients of coefficients of x to the power n minus one on both the sides. Okay. You will automatically get the first relation. You will automatically get the first relation. Okay. Similarly, if you compare the coefficients of x minus two on both the sides, you'll get the second relation and so on and so forth. Is it fine? Any questions? So please note this down. So in class 10, you would have already used this relation for cubic polynomial equation, quadratic equation, but most of you would not be knowing that this is true in general, actually. So it could be used for any polynomial equation in general. Is it fine? Any questions, any concerns? Okay. So for our case, for a quadratic equation, you know, it's going to be, if let's say this equation has two roots, alpha and beta, then remember alpha plus beta is minus B by A, alpha beta is C by A. That is already known to you since class 10th days. Okay. Now time for some questions. Let's take some questions. All right, let's take this question just to give you a, you know, just to you know make everybody uh, recall their class 10th ways of solving equations. So a very simple question is here in front of you. Don't get scared. Solve for X and give me a response on the chat box. Okay, are you sure uh, Vishal, Satyam, that this is the complete answer? <laughs> okay, so we all know that these two are harmonic, uh, sorry, these two are uh, rationalizing factors of each other, isn't it? Because this gives you 25 minus 24, which is one, right? Clearly meaning that this guy, this guy is reciprocal of this guy. Correct. Now. Let's take five plus two root six to the power of X square minus three as a T. So can I say five minus two root six to the power of X square minus three will be one by T, right? It's like, you know, you raising X to the power two minus three on both the sides here. Okay. So what will happen to this equation? This equation will become T plus one by T equal to 10, which means T square minus 10 T plus one will be zero. Correct. 
let's try to solve it using our Shridhar Acharya formula. So it's minus B plus minus B square minus four AC by two A, which is nothing but plus minus root 96 by two A, which is going to give you five plus minus two root six. Yes or no? Correct. So now if you relate five plus two root six to the power X square minus three with five plus two root six, you'll end up getting, you'll end up getting X square minus three as a one, which means X square is four, which means X is plus minus two. Many of you have given me this answer. Well, accept it. No problem with that. But most of you forgot that this could actually be five minus two root six also which means X square minus three as a minus one, which means X square could be two as well, which means X could be plus minus root two also. Okay. So there are four values to this question. X could be plus minus two or plus minus root two. Is it fine? Any questions, any concerns here? Any questions, any concerns? Okay. All set. Great. So let's take the next question. It's a show that question, but again, it can always be objectified. So the question says, show that if P Q R S are real numbers and T R is equal to twice of Q plus S, then at least one of these two equation has real roots. Okay. So after solving it, just say I'm done. No need to give me any justification. Okay. I'll give you around two minutes for this or one and a half minutes for this. So you have to show at least one of them has real roots, at least one of them. Okay. Nobody. All right. We'll start with this quadratic. So let's say I call the discriminant as D one. So can I say discriminant here will be B square minus four AC, which gives you P square minus four Q. And let's say this quadratic X square plus RX plus S equal to zero. Let's say it's discriminant is D two, which is given by R square minus four S. Correct. Now let's add these two discriminants D1 and D2. So let's add them. We'll end up getting P square plus R square minus four Q plus S. Okay. Now we have been given that two Q plus S is equal to PR. So this is given to us. Correct. 
So what I'm planning to do here is that I'm going to replace this minus four Q plus S with minus two PR. Isn't it? Can I do that? And it actually becomes P minus R the whole square. And if P and R are real numbers, so it's only given that all of them are real numbers. Can I say P minus R the whole square will be a quantity greater than or equal to zero? which means the sum of the discriminant is greater than or equal to zero. And this can only happen when at least, when at least one of D one D two is positive. Okay. If both are negative, their sum can never be positive, right? So one has to be positive for sure. If both of them are positive, very good. Okay. The sum will be definitely be positive, but even if one is negative and other is more positive, means having a magnitude more than the neg the guy which is negative, then the total sum will still be positive. So for that, at least one of them should be positive, which means at least one of the equations, at least one of the equations, equations must have, must have a real roots. Hence shown. Is it fine? Any questions, any concerns on this? Do let me know. Is it fine? Any questions? Should we move on to the next problem then? Okay. Let's take this question. If alpha beta are the roots of this equation, find the roots of the second equation. Of course, your answer will be only in terms of what is known to us. Okay. A, B, C, maybe alpha beta like that. So please give me your answer for the roots of the second equation on the chat box, on the chat box. Yes, anybody? I thought this was an easy question. <laughs> okay. See, when you say this equation has roots alpha and beta, right? Can I say in that situation that this is as good as saying X minus alpha into X minus beta by factor theorem, which means I'm trying to say X minus a X minus B minus C is as good as saying X minus alpha X minus beta. Correct. No? Correct. Right. Absolutely. Right. Uh, Vishal. <laughs> So can I say, if this is true, that means this expression is going to hold true, correct? So if somebody is asking you, what are the roots of, what are the roots of 
this equation then it will be as good as asking you the roots of this equation and that is very obvious that it is going to be a and b correct so the roots of this equation will be nothing but a and b problem is done is it fine any questions any concerns any questions any concerns okay all right let's take another one yeah find all roots of this equation if one of the root is 2 plus root 3 come on this is actually a class 10th question but still i would like to ask this question to you all in case you know anybody has forgotten that basic uh, important point that i have given so please solve this question find all the roots of this bi quadratic equation so this is a a bi quadratic so it will have four roots now when i say roots it will include real complex all the type of roots okay so one of them is already given to you you have to find the remaining three let's do it and give me your response again on the chat box okay so as i already told you all the coefficients here if you check all the coefficients 1 2 minus 16 minus 22 7 they are all rational numbers they are all rational numbers isn't it and if i have one of the roots which happens to be an irrational number this is a irrational number q bar bar means not q complement then it just tells us that other root i can actually guess so other root has to be or one of the other roots one of the other roots should be 2 minus root 3 okay it is for sure so do two root i have already found out right so first of all i will try to frame a quadratic with these two roots okay and everybody knows how to frame a quadratic with two given roots so it's nothing but x square minus sum of the roots times x plus product of the roots okay in fact i just need a quadratic expression not a quadratic equation from here so i can say that that given bi quadratic polynomial basically has this quadratic as its factor again i'll repeat the word this bi quadratic the one which i have shown with the curly braces that is a bi quadratic polynomial see guys don't use the word equation and polynomial interchangeably i have seen many people doing it this is a polynomial equation i agree but just this part is a polynomial it is not a equation that expression is a polynomial so what i'm trying to say is that this quadratic is a factor of the given polynomial bi quadratic polynomial x square what was that x4 sorry x4 2x cube 2x cube uh minus 16x square minus 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 22x plus 7 correct that means if you divide by this you should be able to get another factor without leaving any remainder 
so doing it in a slightly maturish way rather than doing it like a class 10th grade so this is going to be one quadratic multiplied to another quadratic now let me guess few of the terms of this quadratic since there is x4 here and there is already an x square sitting here it has to be x square for sure since there is a plus 7 here there has to be and there is a 1 over here there has to be a plus 7 here also correct and in between there will be something like kx so all i need to do is find my k right many of you would have literally gone for a long division by this particular quadratic polynomial but it was not required you could have done it like that also so for getting my k what i will do i will compare the coefficient of x cube i will compare the coefficient of x cube on both sides okay so when i do that left side will give me 2 but the right side will give me minus 4 Minus four plus plus k, correct? That means k value is six. K value is six, which means I could factorize this guy as x square minus four x plus one times x square plus six x plus seven. Okay. So when you are equating this to zero, it means you are equating this to zero, and this is already equated to zero, and we got two plus root three and two minus root three. So now I have to equate this guy to zero. So now equate this guy to zero and get the other two roots from there. So you can use again your Shridhar Acharya formula: minus b plus minus b square minus four ac by two a, which is minus six plus minus two root two by two, which is nothing but minus three plus root two and minus three minus root two. Okay. So four roots, four roots are now as follows. Two plus root three, two minus root three, minus three plus root two, and minus three minus root two. And as you can see here, they are occurring in rationalization factors. Okay, so these two are rationalizing each other, and these two are rationalizing each other. Is it fine? Yeah, of course, Satya. But why are you getting a wrong answer? Why is your answer different from Achintya? Got it right. Why are you getting minus seven and one? Maybe you factorize it. Ah, you factorize it incorrectly. Okay, is it fine? Any questions? Any questions? Any concerns? Okay, so with this, we are going to a very interesting concept. Called transformation of quadratic equation. Transformation of quadratic equations. By the way, this concept is going to be true for any polynomial equation. Many times it works for all the type of equations. So, what is this concept of? What is this concept of transformation of quadratic equation? Okay. Let me give you a brief uh, introduction to this through an example. Okay, very simple example. I'll give you. Let's say I have a equation like this, okay, whose roots are some value alpha and beta. In fact, you can find it out, but I don't want you to find it out. Okay. Now I have a question to you. Okay. Question is find a quadratic equation with roots. With roots alpha plus three and beta plus three. Okay, how will you solve this question? Now, the two ways that students take to solve this question is I'll tell you both the ways. One way is you find out the roots, correct? You find out the roots of this equation. So you find the alpha value and beta value from the given quadratic which is actually factorizable correct so let's say i call this as alpha call this as a beta right and then find your alpha plus 3 which is going to be 4 and beta plus 3 which is going to be 5 and then frame a quadratic equation by using this okay and you get your answer from there okay no denying that this is not going to give you an answer obviously obviously this is going to give you an answer very correct no problem with that another way of doing it is 
you don't find alpha beta directly okay rather you know that alpha plus beta will be minus b by a which in our question should be 3 and alpha beta will be 2 correct c by a, isn't it and since i have asked you to formulate a quadratic equation with roots alpha plus 3 and beta plus 3 this is what you will be doing i mean essentially the same step that i did in the first approach also towards the last okay and here what you will be doing you will be literally you know adding these things up so alpha plus beta plus 6 and here you will end up getting alpha beta plus 3 alpha plus beta plus 9 correct and now you will be using these two values alpha plus beta and alpha beta over here okay so when you use that you get 9x i'm so sorry i forgot an x here yeah so you'll get a 9x and here this will be 2 plus 3 into 3 plus 9 which is actually a 20 and you get your answer okay 90% janta will use this method i know that okay but what if i tell you a method which will not require you to use any of the two but still will do the work for you in maybe slightly time efficient way right then that method is going to be your transformation of quadratic equation method now what is this method this method basically works when you want to find out the equation a quadratic equation whose roots are whose roots are transformed in a same fashion okay so let's say alpha and beta are the roots right and what you see is that this this root is obtained by adding a 3 to it and so is this also so there is a same destiny which is given to both alpha and beta so whatever you are doing with alpha the same thing you are doing with beta so in such situations there is a shorter way to solve this question and that is by the use of transformation of quadratic equation so transformation of quadratic equation i would like to repeat works when you are trying to find out a quadratic equation having such roots which is obtained from the roots of one of the quadratic equation giving same treatment to them are you getting my point is it understood so how does this method actually work so we know that alpha and beta are the roots of so this is a third method for you alpha and beta are the roots of this equation correct okay and since both the roots are given same treatment can i use one of them and say alpha will satisfy this equation which means alpha square minus 3 alpha plus 2 is 0 correct now you want a equation whose roots are alpha plus 3 and beta plus 3 correct so what i'll do here is i'll put my alpha plus 3 as x why i'm putting alpha plus 3 as x because i have used alpha here so my alpha will become x minus 3 correct put it back over here put it back over here you'll end up getting something like this x minus 3 the whole square minus 3 x minus 3 plus 2 and there you go this is the answer to your question because if you simplify it it becomes x square minus 9x plus 20 equal to 0 this is your required answer okay so please note it is only working because both the roots were given the same treatment so your new roots were obtained from the old roots by giving the same treatment to both of them if let's say one was alpha plus 5 and other was alpha plus 2 sorry beta plus 2 then this method is not going to work my dear this method is not going to work right are you getting this point so of course it has got a limited use but it really saves your time if you realize that in your question the question setter is asking you for a quadratic equation by using certain transformation on the roots of a particular equation and they have the same set of transformations then it is going to work are you getting my point so i'll give you more such examples don't worry i'll give you more such examples here so first everybody understand this then we'll be taking in more such scenarios and you will really enjoy using this method it's very very time efficient in certain scenarios okay done all right so let me ask you another question another example let's say i have a equation um 
now this time i will not give you the equation i'll just keep it in terms of unknowns okay let's say this equation this equation has roots alpha and beta right can you get me an equation okay so find a quadratic equation find a quadratic equation quad quadratic equation whose roots are whose roots are alpha plus 1 by let's say 5 and beta plus 1 by 5 can you find a quadratic equation whose roots are these two just give it a try once see see anybody is able to crack this or you can just tell me what should i do with my x over here how will this get transformed i'll just put some brackets here for you to tell me what to do in one shot you can solve this by by, by just telling me what transformations the x will undergo you want to go from basics so if you want to go from basics take any one of them let's say this time i take a beta okay so beta satisfies this quadratic equation correct right now your beta plus 1 by 5 take it as x because you want this to be the root so which means beta is 5x minus 1 so just put this back over here so your answer will become a 5x minus 1 the whole square okay b 5x minus 1 plus c equal to 0 plain and simple done of course if you want to simplify it further you can do it so you can further write it as 25 a x square uh you will get uh, if i am not mistaken uh, minus 10 a from here and 5 b from there okay and your constants will be a minus b plus c equal to 0 oh sorry i have already put x okay so this is going to be your answer so it is so efficient that you don't need to get alpha beta directly you don't have to strike any kind of a beta relation on it you don't have to make you know alpha plus beta is minus b by alpha beta is c by etc etc all those things are already taken care of is this fine okay so now i'll give you a quick you know small exercise on this let's say if ax square plus bx plus c equal to 0 has roots has roots alpha and beta okay then the quadratic equations with roots let's say i take this example so if you are adding any number to both the roots then what will happen your quadratic equation will become ax minus k the whole square bx minus k plus c equal to 0 you don't have to do anything else to get the quadratic equation if you are subtracting any number from k in fact it is the same approach you just have to add that k to x are you getting my point if you are multiplying any non zero number with k oh sorry non zero number k with alpha and beta what will happen your x will become x by k correct right i am doing it quickly but you can always do it at your own pace if you divide a non zero number k to both the roots then it will become x k square b x k plus c yes or no okay and even you can do a non linear change also for example if you have root alpha and root beta right then your x will become x square square like this okay isn't it if you have something like p alpha plus q by m and p beta plus q by m then what will happen to your x it will become m x minus q by p okay this is a more generic version this is actually a generalized form of a b c and d
Are you getting my point? So this list can go on and on. I don't want to write all the scenarios possible, but what I want you to give you an idea is that if you are asked to find out a equation whose roots is a transform transformed version of the roots of a given equation, and the transformation is applied same to both the roots, then you can always try out this method, which will be actually time efficient. Of course, one time will go in simplifying it, but once you have written it, simplifying is just a clerical work. Is it fine? Any questions, any concerns, anybody? Okay, maybe when we solve a question, things will become clearer for us. Let's take this question. If alpha, beta are the roots of Oh, sorry. If alpha beta are the roots of x square minus px plus q equal to zero, then find the equation whose roots are these two. And you can see here that both the roots are given the same treatment, right? So you can definitely try out for transformation of equation concept. If done, you can give me a response in the chat box. Okay, Satyam. So what did I tell you uh, with this approach? Since alpha and beta are e roots of these two equations, we can say this is going to be satisfied. Okay. All you need to do is take one of them, which contains alpha equated to X. Correct. Which means P minus alpha is Q by X, which means alpha is nothing but P minus Q by X, or you can say P X minus Q, or let it be P minus Q by X. Okay. Just replace it over here. Whatever answer you get, that is your answer. Okay. So it'll be P minus Q by X, the whole square minus P, P minus Q by X plus Q equal to zero. Okay. Let's expand it. This will be P square, uh, Q square by X square minus two P Q by X again, minus P square plus P Q by X plus Q equal to zero. This and this gets canceled off. And I think this and this will get adjusted also. So Q square by X square minus P Q by X plus Q equal to zero. Okay. So if you multiply with X square, you'll end up getting something like this. Okay. Yes or no? Drop a factor of Q if you want. So this is a very surprising question because despite transforming the roots, your equation did not change. <laughs> okay. So basically this is such a relation where you would realize that probably this guy became a beta and this guy became an alpha back. <laughs> Interesting question though. So despite making the change to the roots, the equation did not change, which means the equation, the, the two transformed roots were actually the same roots. Okay. Anyways, good. Let's take another one. 
another question is it clear everybody any any doubt related to this see lot of questions have come based on this and people who have not uh, understood this concept took a longer time to solve the question let's try this one if alpha beta are the roots of this equation find the roots of this guy okay so this question has been framed in a slightly reverse way okay so look at this equation and look at this equation you will see the presence of a b c in both of them but there is a small change done to the root over here uh, to the x value over here okay so let me bring your attention to something which is very interesting divide by x minus 1 the whole square okay if you divide by x minus 1 the whole square you end up getting something like this okay now i'll do a small activity here i will observe this sign and make it 1 minus x okay here also i will make it 1 minus x because being subjected to square power it will have no meaning it will have no uh, you know issues actually okay now see treat this term to be like your y right okay so let's say i call this term as a y So this term is a y. Now please understand that if this is satisfying it, which means if you compare it with this equation, a alpha square b alpha plus c equal to zero, your y is actually like either your alpha or your beta. Okay, alpha or is like your beta. Correct, right? Because the same quadratic equation. cannot have three roots so either that y will be alpha or y will be beta so if y is alpha means you are trying to say x by 1 minus x is alpha correct and if you are trying that is if you are trying to say it is beta that means you are trying to say x by 1 minus x is beta so from here if you try to solve for alpha x what will you get this is nothing but alpha minus alpha x so which is alpha plus 1 x equal to alpha so x is alpha by alpha plus 1 similarly here i will not do everything here similarly here your x will be beta by beta plus 1 right in short 
the other quadratic equation the roots will be alpha by alpha plus 1 and beta by beta plus 1 right so this is just a reverse of what we were actually learning so we were learning that if the roots are transformed in the same fashion what will be the new equation so here the question setter has given a new equation to you and asks you and asking you what is the transformed root okay so both the directions the question can be framed is it fine any questions any concerns here Okay, all done, copied, understood more importantly. I understand this is a slightly new concept for you because in 10th, you were not taught about transformation of equations. All right, let's take one last question on this. If alpha and beta are roots of, if alpha and beta are roots of, uh 3x square plus 2x plus 1 equal to 0 okay then find the value of find the value are you find the value of 1 minus alpha 1 plus alpha cube plus 1 minus beta by 1 plus beta cube Give me a response in the chat box.
Yes. Anybody? Nobody. Okay. Chalo, let's solve this question. Uh, let's call this expression as a P and let's call this expression as a Q. Okay. So can I ask you a simple question? Give me an equation. Give me a quadratic equation whose roots are P and Q. Oh, many people want an answer. Fine. Sorry, many people want some time. <laughs> uh, one minute. Okay, fine. I'll wait for one minute. Not an issue. Last class. So as you say. <laughs> last class for the year, by the way. <laughs> for the academic year, not the actual year. Okay. See, if you're taking this much time means your approach is not right. That means you will find uh, that you're doing a lot of unnecessary things. Okay. See, let me ask you this question. What will be the equation? Can we get an equation with roots, with roots P and Q? Okay. What is this equation? Can we find that out? Very simple. Here we can see that P and Q are actually the same transformations of alpha and beta, right? So I can use the transformation skills over here. I will just change, take this as an X. Okay. Apply componendo and dividendo. If you apply componendo and dividendo, alpha will be one minus X by one plus X. Correct? No. Yeah. Right. Componendo dividendo is a very good tool for such cases. Okay. Now put this in your original equation. So the original equation that is three X square that will be satisfied by alpha, right? So put it over here. So you'll end up getting three, one minus X, one plus X whole square two one minus X, one plus X plus one. Okay. And put it to zero. So multiply throughout with one plus X, the whole square that will give something like this. Okay. Correct. Collect your X squared, X squared terms together. So if I'm not mistaken, uh, this will give you plus three X square minus two X square plus X square. That's nothing but two X square. Okay. Collect your X terms together. This will give you minus six X. Correct. Correct. Minus six X and plus two X. So that's four X. Oh, sorry. Minus four X. Okay. And let's collect your constants together. This will be three plus two, five, five plus one, six, right? In other words, X square minus two X plus three equal to zero will have roots P and Q. Correct. Which means, you know, P plus Q, which means, you know, P into Q also by beta relation. Correct. By beta's relation, you know, these values also. Now, what are the questions that are asking you? Questions that are asking you PQ plus QQ. Okay. So you are supposed to find out PQ plus QQ, which is nothing but P plus Q, the whole Q minus three PQ P plus Q, isn't it? So which is two Q minus three into three into two, which is nothing but minus 10 problem is solved. This is your answer. Is it fine? Any questions, any concerns, please have a good look at it and tell me if you want me to explain any part again. Okay. All right. Convinced. Any questions?
All right. So I'm convinced that you all have understood this. The next concept, which is the second last concept in this topic that we are going to talk about is the conditions for common root conditions for two quadratic equations to have common roots quadratic equations to have common root or roots okay so guys uh, we all know that a quadratic equation can have two roots right so let's say there are two quadratic equations q1 and q2 okay one is a1x square b1x plus c1 equal to 0 and another is a2x square b2x plus c2 equal to 0 okay now both of them can have two two roots right so what is the condition that uh, should be satisfied between your a1 b1 c1 a2 b2 c2 that means these uh, you know coefficients of these two quadratic equations so that they have both the roots common let's start with this scenario so let's discuss if you want two quadratic equations to have sorry both the roots common what condition must be satisfied can anybody tell me that two quadratic equations same roots both of the roots are same what condition must be satisfied between the coefficients of the, those quadratic equation that means what relation must exist between a1 b1 c1 a2 b2 c2 right satyam so that, it's very obvious that the quadratic equation one and two must be proportional to each other in the sense that one is the other equation multiplied with some k in other words, I can say the coefficients of x square x and constants must be the same. Isn't it? Yes or no? Now here, a very important add-on I want to put here. If these two quadratic equations are giving you the same roots, that doesn't mean this expression is same as this expression. You can't say a1 is equal to a2, b1 is equal to b2, c1 is equal to c2. You cannot say that. But you can definitely say that one quadratic equation, or you can say one quadratic expression, the word is expression, not equation. One quadratic expression is a multiple of, or you can say is proportional to the other one. Okay. So you can say a one is Lambda times a two B one is also Lambda times B two and C one is Lambda times B two. This is what you can comment. Okay. So there was one student uh, last year. I asked him this question that. Uh, if these two equations have same root common, does it mean that if I draw a graph like this for both the, let's say quadratic polynomials, will I get the same graph? Will they, will they have the same graph means this parabola and this parabola will be exactly the same. Yes, not necessarily. So the graphs graphs need not be need not be same, but yes, what is same is the points where they will be cutting the X axis. So let's say if one is this white one. Okay. Let's say I'm just making a dummy one. The other may be something like this. Okay. But still cutting the X axis at the very same position. So graph, these two graphs need not be the same. Okay. So please understand these, these are small, small things where, where you might get stumped. Okay. Is it fine? All right. Let's talk about the second case here when at least one root is common. Let's talk about that. Can I move on to the next one? Yeah. So what are the conditions that must be satisfied if two quadratic equations have at least one root common, at least one root common means it can have both the roots common also. Okay. By the way, we'll say sir, both the roots common. We already talked about. Okay. So this situation, the second situation is going to be a superset of the first situation. I will tell you why once we start discussing it. Okay. So as of now, we'll say, let's say this quadratic equation Q1, this quadratic equation Q1 and this quadratic equation Q2, 
this quadratic equation q2 okay has one known common root let's say has one common root alpha okay there may be more roots also let's say but i know for sure that one common root is there and let's say that root is alpha okay now what we are doing we are trying to find out the condition okay so that is our main purpose Now, our main agenda is to find the condition that must be satisfied if these two quadratic equation has at least one root common okay so let's say i call that root which is common to be alpha okay one of them is sufficient so that means alpha should satisfy both the equations that means alpha should satisfy this also alpha should satisfy this also correct now here for the time being for the time being let's call alpha square as capital x and alpha as capital y just for the time being okay so let let alpha square be capital x and alpha be capital y so can i say the same set of equations will now be something like a1 capital x b1 capital y plus c1 equal to 0 and a2 capital x b2 capital y plus c2 equal to 0 right can we do a, can we can you all do me a favor can you solve for capital x and capital y can somebody give me capital x and capital y okay one interesting approach would be to use cross multiplication method how many of you know cross multiplication method ah huh? everybody knows here yes no sir i knew but i forgot oh sorry this is uh, a1 a1 b2 minus a2 b2. my bad a1 b2 minus a2 b1 yes tell me learn but never got to use now you will get to use it <laughs> and uh, you will you'll realize that this actually is called the kramer's rule of solving a system of linear equations okay you learn that again in your matrices and determinants chapter which is going to come like four five three four months down the line okay by the way you are you should all, you should start considering yourself to be in class 12 now unofficially <laughs> okay yeah till the final exam is not over <laughs> but normally you know i mean nps students super bright students okay i should not say any further okay so x will be b1 c2 minus b2 c1 by a1 b2 minus a2 b1 and your y will be uh, just note that there is a minus sign sitting over here so i will just swap the positions of the denominator term while taking it to the next side okay is it fine now the reason i found out capital x and capital y is because now i want to say alpha square is this and alpha is this right which means y squared is your x so if you square this guy up if you square this guy up you should get the x guy which is your square of this which is square of the alpha indirectly i am trying to say this right because if x is this and y is this then x is actually the square of y because of our assumption of x and y right which further means which further means i'll be just writing it on the top which further means b1 c2 minus b2 c1 times a1 b2 minus a2 b1 is equal to a2 c1 minus a1 c2 whole square correct now this is the condition that we were actually looking for and you would be thinking sir such an ugly condition how do i how do we remember this it's so ugly to remember the previous one was much better right a1 by a2 is b1 by b2 is c1 by c2 so how do we ex how do you expect us or how do the examiner expect us to remember this condition okay not to worry i'll give you some memory aid for this by the way i'm i'm expecting everybody to be aware of determinants expression right everybody knows determinant have you seen determinant before 
something like this uh let's say x y a b can you can you write it as b x minus a y you are all aware of this everybody everybody knows this determinant you would have used it in your uh, cross product concept okay now i'll be using my determinant idea over here look at this term can i write it as determinant a1 a2 b1 b2 correct me if i'm wrong right look at this term can you write it as b1 b2 c1 c2 correct look at this term can you write it as c1 c2 a1 a2 the whole square right by the way squaring doesn't make a difference you're still getting the same expression okay now this is much easy to remember why it is easy to remember because it is like a b b c c a okay you just have to remember this square over here right now it is simple to remember okay so please note this down this is your condition to have at least one root common now many people ask me sir why do you say at least one root common isn't it only exactly one root common see if you look at the derivation in the derivation i did not talk about the other root i've just taken one root to be common and i started with it even if other root is common the same procedure will be followed no right and not only that not only that if both roots are common then you would realize that let's say if both roots are common if both roots are common as per our previous discussion a1 will be equal to lambda a2 correct or in other words i can say a1 by a2 is b1 by b2 okay which means a1 b2 minus a2 b1 is zero right which will definitely make this guy as a zero correct similarly if roots were both roots were common we know that b1 by b2 is c1 by c2 which means b1 c2 minus b2 c1 would have been zero which means this guy would have been zero correct and not only that we also know that a1 by a2 is c1 by c2 which means a1 c2 minus a2 c1 would also have been zero which means this guy will also have been zero so your zero and zero will be equal to each other are you getting my point so this is also addressing this concern also that both roots may be common are you getting my point so you can say this condition to be more robust more generic getting it is it fine any questions any concerns here for the situation of at least one root common so both root common the situation the condition is very simple straight forward a1 by a2 is equal to b1 by b2 is equal to c1 by c2 if you have at least one root common it becomes determinant of a1 a2 b1 b2 times determinant of b1 b2 c1 c2 is equal to square of the determinant c1 c2 a1 a2 and this is cyclic in nature you can remember it okay a b b c c a kind of a thing is it fine any questions any concerns let's take a question let's take a question question is if this equation and this equation have a common root show that a is to b is to c is 1 is to 2 is to 3 just write it down on the chat box if you are done
yes this was actually an easy question see uh, all of you please pay attention here let's say let's say this has got two roots okay alpha and beta correct and this equation has got one of the roots common i don't know about the other one okay one of the roots i know it's for sure common okay but what i also realize is that this quadratic discriminant is actually negative that means b square minus 4ac is a negative term which means if this is p plus iq then this should have been p minus iq right yes or no yes or no yes or no yes or no that means if this is p plus iq then can i do something about the other root because a b c are real numbers here look at the question a b c are real numbers so if the coefficient of a quadratic equation are real and if one root and if one root is p plus iq what is the other root it has to be p minus iq correct what does this eventually mean eventually means both roots are common both roots are common yes or no that means a by 1 is equal to b by 2 is equal to c by 3 hence true is it fine any questions any questions okay let's take one more question
Yes, any response? Did you get some lambda values? Okay, Harshita, can you, can you type them out on the chat box? Okay. Uh, let's try to let's try to write down that situation which we have written a1 a2 b1 b2 into b1 b2 c1 c2 is equal to c1 c2 a1 a2 determinant whole square okay so now let's write down what is a1 a2 a1 a2 will be 1 lambda b1 b2 will be minus 110 okay minus 110 c1 c2 will be minus 12 3 this will be minus 12 3, 1 lambda square. Okay. On simplification, this gives you uh, 10 plus lambda, the 10 plus lambda, and this is going to be minus 310 is minus 117. Oh, sorry, plus 117. Plus 117. Okay. This will be 12 lambda plus 3, the whole square. Let's simplify it. So let's collect the lambda square coefficients. Lambda square coefficients will be 144 minus 117, which is going to be 16. Correct. Am I missing out anything, any important thing here? Oh, sorry. What am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And lambda coefficients will be 117 minus uh, 12 into 3 into this. So 117 minus uh, 117 minus 144. what am I doing? 117 minus 72. Sorry. <laughs> That's going to be 45. That's going to be 45. So plus 45 lambda and constant terms would be 1170 minus 9, which will be minus 1161. Okay. I think we can drop a factor of uh, 9 throughout. So that will give you 16 lambda square. This will be minus uh, 5 lambda, sorry, plus this was minus, I believe. Yeah. And this will be minus 129. Correct. Now this is factorizable as uh, 16 lambda square minus 48 lambda plus 43 lambda minus 129 equal to zero. Take 16 lambda common, take 43 common. And this is factorizable as this, correct? So you should all be getting the lambda value as three and minus 43 by 16. Are you getting this? Is it fine? Okay. So if lambda value is three, then what will be the common roots? First of all, if I just simplify this, okay. Uh, is this going to be factorizable? Yes, it is factorizable as X minus four X plus three. Okay. So this has a root four and a minus three. Okay. So if you take lambda value as lambda value as three, Okay. Then what will happen? Then the other equation will become three la X square, sorry, three X square plus 10 X plus three equal to zero. And this is easily factorizable like this.
okay that means the common root will be minus 3 okay so the common root will be minus 3 in this case okay so common root will be minus 3 in this case but if you take lambda value as minus 43 by 16 minus 43 by 16 without much hiccup i can say the common root will be 4 in that case right because any one of the root has to be common right so if minus 3 is addressed when lambda was 3 then with lambda is minus 43 by 16 your root common root should be 4 done is it fine any questions any concerns all right so with this we'll take a quick break of 15 minutes right now the time sorry time is 6 10 pm we'll meet exactly at 6 25 pm on the other side of the break i'll be doing the concept of location of roots okay i you at 6 11 so let's meet at 6 26 i'll be fair <laughs> Okay, so let's meet at 6, 6, uh, 626 sharp. See you on the other side of the break. So the last leg of the chapter is where we are going to talk about uh, location of, of roots of a quadratic equation. Okay. Of a quadratic equation. Now, many times you will be given a quadratic equation with certain parameters, right? For example, they would mention the value of A, they will mention the value of C, but they will not mention you the value of B. Maybe they will write a, you know, lambda for B. Okay. Or it could happen with all of them also. It, now, A, B, C themselves could be written in terms of parameters. Parameters means something which is not known actually. Okay. You will not call it as a variable because you know, it's, it's something which is unknown to you. Okay. And they will say that this particular quadratic equation has both the roots positive. What should be the range of value of that Lambda, right? Or they will say that particular quadratic equation has both the roots lesser than a given number, right? So these type of questions are going to be, you know, addressed under the present discussion that we are going to have. That if you give, if they give you a quadratic equation with some unknown, right? And it could be like A, B, C could all be unknown to you in terms of some Lambda or M or whatever. And they give you that this quadratic equation should have, you know, the two roots satisfying so and so conditions. What should be the interval in which Lambda should lie? Okay. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about it through cases. So I'll be addressing six cases over here. Okay. So what are the six cases? Let's talk about it. So my first case is where I will say both the roots, both the roots are lesser than a given number K. Okay. So what should be the condition between A, B, C, or what should be the number of conditions that must be satisfied so that your both the roots are less than a given number K, a given real number K. Okay. So let's discuss it one by one. See, when you talk about a quadratic equation, all depends upon your A value, right? So whether it opens upwards or open downwards, it depends on your A value. Okay. So irrespective of whether A is positive, that means your quadratic is opening upwards or your quadratic is opening downwards. We will try to devise a set of conditions, which will be universally applicable to both of them. Okay. So what conditions you must honor so that both the roots of this quadratic equation are less than a given number K, both the roots of this quadratic equation are less than a given number K. Okay. Now as per you, what should be the conditions that must be satisfied? For me, the first condition that must be satisfied is your discriminant must be greater than equal to zero. Your discriminant must be greater than equal to zero. And I'm sure all of you would agree with me on that. Why? 
why discriminant must be greater than equal to zero? Are, if you're saying your roots are lesser than a given real number, they must exist first of all. No? <laughs> Without existing, how can you say that a you know, number is lesser or greater than the other number? So your roots must exist first of all. Correct. So this is number one condition. Number two condition, which I say should be fulfilled if you want your both the roots to be lesser than K is that F of K into A should be positive. Yes or no? And if you note down, I have written this condition by taking into consideration both the scenarios. In this scenario, f of k is positive. Right? But in this scenario, f of k is negative, right? So if you if you are wondering why did I put this a here? Because in either of the two cases, if you see a into f of k, a is positive, f of k is also positive, so your product is positive. In the second scenario, in the in the downward opening parabola, your a is negative, f of k is also negative, so the product again becomes positive. So can I say this condition is a universal condition for both the scenarios where your parabola is either opening upwards or downwards, it doesn't matter. Yes or no? Now tell me, are these two conditions sufficient enough or are they necessary? Are they only necessary or are they sufficient enough? That means if a quadratic equation discriminant is greater than or equal to zero. Achha, by the way, some of you would be wondering, what is this F? Uh, I'm actually calling this guy as F. This guy, this guy as F of X. Okay. Yeah. So is these, are these two conditions sufficient enough or are they necessary? What do you think? If these two conditions are met, will my quadratic equation roots, okay, will always be lesser than K or there is something more that I need. Okay. So Satyam is saying it is necessary. So Satyam, tell me the condition that is required to make it sufficient. Okay. <laughs> So you were right in saying that it is necessary, but not sufficient because why it is not sufficient because see, even if your K was here, isn't it? Or even if your K was here, can I say both these conditions would still have been satisfied? Yes or no. So how do I ensure that my roots are actually lesser than K, but not greater than K. So here I got the third and final condition so that it becomes sufficient or they all become sufficient together. Can I say the midpoint of this, which is minus B by two A. Okay. That will always be lesser than K. So together they now become sufficient conditions. Isn't it sufficient conditions? In other words, if I take the overlap of this three conditions intersection, whatever answer I get, that would be my acceptable answer. Right. Let me show you a question like this so that you get a better idea of what I'm trying to discuss here. Let's say this question. Let's say this question. Yeah. So there is a quadratic given to you and you can see that this quadratic is not completely expressed. It has got some M's and all in it. Okay. So certain values are not given to you. Okay. So M is a parameter you can say here. Now read the question. The question says, find the value of M for which let's target the first part of the question here only subsequent parts. I will come with after certain discussions, both the roots are smaller than two. Okay. So what should be the value or values of M such that both the roots are smaller than two. Now, how will I solve this question? Let me address this question so that you get an idea here. First of all, thankfully my a is one. So it's an upward opening parabola. No need to worry about the second case. Okay. So only one case is what you're you know, required to address. Now you want your both roots to be smaller than two. So let's say this is two. Okay. So can I say, first of all, discriminant should be greater than or equal to zero, right? That means 
that means b square minus 4ac b square minus 4ac should be greater than equal to 0 let's try to solve this so this will give you b m square uh, minus 10m and uh, 9 yeah greater than equal to 0 so this is factorizable right okay so if you look at a wavy curve here uh, your m should be sorry your m should be either lesser than 1 or greater than 9 correct so this is only the first condition okay so let me move on to the second condition let me just box it first or what i know first here. second condition is your f of 2 here would be positive f being the polynomial involved in that quadratic equation so this guy should be positive correct so f of 2 should be positive let me write it in white so f of 2 should be positive positive not greater than equal to 0 pause exactly greater than 0 yeah so f2 is what in this expression you have to put your x as a 2 so that means 4 minus 4 minus 2 times m minus 3 if i am not mistaken 2 times m minus 3 yeah plus m should be greater than 0 okay which means which means 10 minus m should be greater than 0 which means m should be less than 10 right let me write it in white so that we rhyme with our okay so this is our second condition correct but as i told you there is one more condition required and what is that condition minus b by 2a should be lesser than 2 in this case so what is minus b by 2a minus b minus b is m minus 3 by 2 so m minus 3 by 2 is less than 2 that means m should be less than 7 yes or no m should be less than 7 correct now these three conditions must simultaneously be satisfied right in order to give you your roots both less than 2 so i will try to take a overlap or intersection of 1 and 2 and 3 so let's take an intersection of 1 2 and 3 over here okay so i'll use my uh, number line method to do it because i find that method easier to use so first condition says i want to be less than 1 or greater than 9 second condition says i want to be less than 10 third condition says i want to be lesser than 7 correct lesser than 7 now which part of the graph do you see all the three lines overlapping obviously this part right so your overlapping condition will be m should be less than equal to 1 or you can say m should belong to minus infinity to 1 this is your final answer to the question okay so if you choose any m value which is between minus 1 to sorry minus infinity to 1 you would realize that the both roots of this quadratic equation will come out to be smaller than 2 is it clear i hope this example has given you an idea about what type of questions we will be getting with respect to this concept yes or no anything that you want to copy ask please do so All good. Okay. So from here on, you will be, you will be driving the story. Okay. You will be driving the theory and story also. So next case, which I'm going to ask you only. Okay. If your both roots are greater than a given number K, both roots are greater than 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 a given real number k a given real number k then tell me what conditions must be satisfied 
for your purpose, for your convenience, I'm going to draw the two graphs, which you will require. One is an upward opening parabola. Other is a downward opening parabola. Okay. You want both your roots to be greater than K. That means K should lie somewhere over here. Okay. Oh, by the way, if I'm making in the negative direction, that doesn't mean K is a negative number. It's just that it happened to happen in the diagram. Yeah. Tell me the conditions that must be satisfied. Let's start with the first condition. Who will tell me the first condition? Write it down on the chat box. Okay. So Satyam says, let's start with D greater than or equal to zero. Exactly. Satyam roots must be real. First of all. Okay. Then only we can talk about it being greater or lesser than something, right? Second condition. Second condition. Who will tell me? You can use your F of X as a X square plus BX plus C if you need it. Can I say here, a f of k will be positive again, but again, note that these two are necessary conditions, but not sufficient. So what will you need? You will need the final nail in the coffin, which will make it sufficient is your minus B by two a should be actually greater than K. Yes or no? Yes or no? So can I say these together, these three simultaneously must be satisfied. If you want any quadratic equation to have both the roots greater than a given number K. Okay. Here I would like to write again, your F of X is your A X square plus B X plus C the, the quadratic polynomial part I'm calling as F of X. Okay. Is it clear or not guys? Are you, is it making sense to you? This is a very important type of question being asked in very competitive, many competitive exams. So let's take the same question. I think it has got eight sub parts. I think the second sub part is where we can, you know, sit and solve. Yeah. So the second part basically talks about our present scenario. Yes. Anybody? Okay. Okay, Satya, very good. 
See, first condition, as I told you, D should be greater than equal to zero. By the way, we had already solved it, and this gave us m lying between minus infinity to one union nine to infinity. Correct. So we have already solved it. No need to solve it again because we are using the same quadratic here also. Second scenario is um, f of two should be greater than zero because a is one anyways. So this also we had solved it in the previous slide. Correct. What was it? Just to yeah, what was it? Are you not this one, the one before this? Hmm. Yeah, this gave us m less than ten. Correct. So I'll be using that only. So save your time because we have already done uh, half the conditions here. So m should be less than ten. M should be less than ten. Okay. And the third condition says. Uh, minus b by two a, that should be greater than two. Correct. Okay. I think we had solved less than two in the previous slide, so we can use that information as well. Correct. So m less than seven will now become m greater than seven in this case. Correct. M greater than seven. Okay. So these three conditions now we have to take an overlap. Okay, let's take an overlap. So again, critical values are one, nine, seven, one, nine, seven, ten. So the first fellow says, "I want to be lesser than one and greater than nine. The second fellow says, "I want to be less than ten. Third fellow says, "I want to be greater than seven." Where is the overlap happening? Overlap is happening here. So the answer is m should be greater than or equal to nine. That means m should belong to nine to infinity, open at infinity, and close at nine. Oh, I'm so sorry. So sorry. So sorry. Thank you. Uh, it is only in this zone. Oh, yeah. So nine to ten. Ten is yeah. Is it fine? Any questions here? Any questions? Any concerns? Clear? Understood? Okay. Comfortable with this concept now? All right. Chalo, we'll take other conditions as well slowly. Next condition that I would like you to tell me. What should be the condition which should be satisfied if a given real number k, a given real number k lies between the roots, lies between the roots. Okay. So again, let me make the two scenarios here. So what should be the condition which must be satisfied if you want a number k to lie between the roots between doesn't mean center between means somewhere in between the interval alpha beta. Okay. So what conditions must be satisfied? Start writing them down on the chat box. Let me see who's the first one to write the first condition. Oh, no, sir. D should be purely greater than zero, not greater than equal to. <laughs> now, why all of a sudden, sir, only greater than, not greater than equal to? Because if a number K lies between the roots, roots must be distinct. No. Okay. They can't be real and equal. They have to be real for sure, but real and distinct. So don't include equal to zero. It will be greater than zero. Okay. What next? Right. The second condition is uh, absolutely right. So a into f of k should be negative. Everybody agrees with this. Everybody agrees with this. Is there anything else needed or are these two sufficient? Sufficient or you need something more? 
means if these two conditions are, are met can i say the k value will be definitely between the roots it can't be like enge honge <laughs> yes sir okay i have become sir now <laughs> thank you <laughs> all right let's take a question on this are i was joking satyam <laughs> yes let's take a question on this the same question just to make your life easy so that you don't have to recalculate the th same things over and over again let's do the third part one root is smaller than 2 and the other root is greater than 2 solve this everybody should now give me the answer yes anybody see one root is smaller than two other root is greater than two means two lies between the roots <laughs> a fancy way of saying that two lies between the roots correct so if two lies between the roots okay somewhere in between i know the first condition will be satisfied discriminant greater than 0 By the way, discriminant greater than zero gave will give you m belonging to minus infinity to one open brackets. Okay, you will all use open bracket here because it is not greater than equal to; it is just greater than. Okay, so pure inequality is there. Second condition is f of two should be negative. F of two should be negative. Now this will give you m greater than ten, if I am not mistaken. Correct. Let's take an overlap of the two scenario. One, nine, ten. The first fellow says, "I want to be less than one, greater than nine." Second fellow says, "I want to be greater than ten." Yes or no? So where is the overlap happening? Where is the overlap happening? Ten to infinity, no. <laughs> yeah. So overlap is happening between ten to infinity. So ten open. Okay, infinity will definitely be open. Is it fine? Any questions? Any concerns? So this becomes your answer to the given question. Is it fine? Any issues? So this was our situation where both the roots, a uh, one of the root is higher than a number. and other root is lesser than the same number okay that means that number lies between the roots next fourth situation fourth situation is exactly one root lies between two given numbers k1 and k2 okay two given real numbers k1 and k2 okay let's try to write down this situation let's try to analyze this situation so what conditions universally will work for both the types of parabola irrespective of whether they open upwards or open downwards okay yeah oh sorry okay so exactly one root lies between k1 and k2 so let's say it could be a situation like this or it could be a situation like this k1 is here k2 is here okay right similarly here also k1 k2 or k1 k2 something like this okay so please ensure we have to take care of all the four situations here okay so tell me think carefully and answer what conditions must be true if you want exactly one root 
whether alpha whether beta uh, or beta doesn't matter whatever conditions you should write it should accommodate both the situations okay so think carefully and write Yes, sir. Tell me. <laughs> what absolute silence? Okay, so Satyam is saying D should be greater than zero. Agreed, right? Because your root should be real as well as distinct. Correct. Okay. Now, actually, just to you know reduce the conditions, can I just say f of k one and f of k two must be of opposite signs? Correct. So a becomes irrelevant there. A becomes irrelevant here. So all I can say is that whether you take this situation, both will be opposite in sign, or you take this situation, both will be opposite in sign, or whether you take this situation, opposite in sign, or this situation, opposite in sign. Correct? Are these two sufficient enough, or do you think more is required? Are they necessary, or are they are they sufficient? Are they just necessary or are they sufficient? What do you think? I believe they are sufficient. So there is no other thing required. If you honor these two conditions, you will definitely have one of the exactly one of the roots lying between K one and K two. Is it fine? Any questions? Any questions, guys? I am not asking you to mug up these conditions. Okay. it will come automatically to you when you analyze the situation okay so there are six such situations we are right now on the fourth one so i don't think so you will be able to memorize these things and don't try to do that if you cannot rather analyze the situation as per the situation given as per the question given to you okay let's take the fourth question here Exactly one root lies between the interval one comma two. done anybody okay okay so as i as i basically he told you first of all discriminant should be greater than 0 that means again m should be minus infinity to 1 union 9 to infinity correct second situation is your f of 1 and f of 2 product should be negative by the way f of 1 is just going to give you a 4 okay and f of 2 is going to give you 10 minus m so this should be negative that means m should be m should be greater than 10 okay now take an overlap i think it should give you the same answer like what we had for the previous one isn't it yeah so 1 9 10 
So the first guy says, I want to be lesser than one or greater than nine. The second guy says, I want to be greater than 10. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So overlap basically is between open interval 10 to infinity. So this becomes your answer to that question. Is it fine? Any questions, any concerns? Okay. Next. Fifth condition is where both roots, both roots lie between K1 and K2. K1 and K2 are basically two given, given real numbers. Okay. Let me make a quick diagram. So K1 and K2 lie between the, okay, sorry. The roots lie between K1 and K2. Sorry, 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 sorry. So that means your K1, K2 should be lying here. Okay. Yes. Start telling me the conditions. I am waiting. Sir, we don't know beta and alpha. Oh, sorry. Madam, we don't know beta and alpha. You have just been given K1, K2. Alpha, beta, you have to find it out and that will come in, come in terms of your parameters. So can we think of a smarter way out? Okay. Discriminant should be greater than zero is what many people are saying, but I disagree with it because discriminant could be equal to zero also. Because roots are lying between K1, K2 and roots can be same also. No, who is stopping K uh, roots from being same, right? They can be same also. Correct. That is condition number one. What else? F of K1, F of K2 would be positive. Now Satyam, this is a, this will lead to false positive because K1, K2 product would be positive even if they are within the roots. You know? Let's say K1 is here, K2 is here, then still both will be negative and hence their product will be positive. And if let's say it is this situation also, both will be positive, hence their product will be positive. So that condition is going to lead to unwanted results. Okay. Can I say here, here that AF of K1 and AF of K2 both would be positive? That is for sure. Correct. Now, are these three sufficient or do you require more conditions? Sufficient. Okay. Harshita, just to answer your, I mean, just to respond to your answer, even if K1, K2 was like this. Okay. Then the same three conditions will be satisfied now. So how are you ensuring that K1, K2 are on the opposite side? I mean, the roots are between this, those two. Ah, so this is, these three are not sufficient. These three are not sufficient. They are necessary. Right? Inko to hona hi hai, but iske alawa bhi ek cheez aur hona hai. And what is that? Minus B by 2A should lie between K1, K2. Absolutely right, Satyam. Okay. Because if this is satisfied, then intersection is going to give you those values or those situations where your roots will be between K1, K2 for sure. Pakka, pakka. Guarantee. Is it fine? Any questions? Okay. Let's take a question. 
Hey, Monday you have a paper. Monday exam is there. Computer project. Acha. Yes. So, which question should we talk about? Uh, talk about. Talk about. Both routes lie in the interval one to two. Op, uh, uh, sub part five. We should solve. Both the routes lie between one to two. Very good, Harshita. Okay, Satyam. Okay, so some of you are saying there cannot be any real value of M for which this condition is going to be fulfilled. Okay, great. Let's check it out. So the first condition says discriminant should be greater than or equal to zero, which means again M should lie between. When I change the color, it doesn't change. Yeah, M lies between minus infinity to one, union nine to infinity. Okay. Second situation which we saw was um, f of one into a should be greater than zero. Correct. So f of one comes out to be four. Four greater than zero. This is true for all real values. Okay. So any M you take, this is going to be true. Third condition is a into f of k two. That means f of two should be also greater than zero, which means m should be less than ten. Correct. And finally, minus b by two a should lie between one and two. That means m minus three by two should lie between one and two, which clearly means m should lie between five and seven. M should lie between five and seven. Now these four uh, conditions written in yellow. Let's try to take their overlap. So I need a one. I need a five. I need a nine. I need sorry seven. I forgot. I need a ten also. Okay, yeah. So first condition says, hey, I want to be less than one or greater than nine. Second condition says, "Hey, I can be any real numbers." Third condition says, "I want to be lesser than ten." Fourth condition says, "I want to be between five and seven." Is there any place where all the four are agreeing with each other? Illa, no place. Okay, so what does it mean? It means there is no real value of M, so answer is M is a null set. Okay, is this fine? So it is, you know, a possibility that you cannot have any real number for which this condition is going to be satisfied. Is it fine? Any questions? Any concerns?
Okay, have a look at it. Tell me if you have any questions. Okay, so with this, we'll now move on to our six conditions. When that given K1, K2, okay, so K1, K2, these are two given real numbers. They lie between the roots. They lie between the between the roots. Okay, again, let's quickly analyze by making the two situations here. Are what I'm drawing? Sorry. <laughs> K1, K2 should lie between the roots. Now, why am I drawing? Yeah. K1, K2 should lie between the roots. Yes. Tell me which conditions must be satisfied. Condition number one. Who will tell me? So the root should be distinct if this, uh, this has to happen. So discriminant should be greater than zero. Correct. What else? What else? Can I say A into F of K1 should be negative? A into F of K2 should also be negative. Correct? Any other thing that I'm missing off or are these two good enough? Sufficient? Oh, sorry, are these three sufficient? I think so. Yes, these three are sufficient because any other situation, if you take these, one of these three conditions will get violated. Okay. All right. So with this, we come to the next question on that particular list. Question number or subpart number six. One root is greater than two and the other root is smaller than two. One root is greater than two, other root is smaller than two. That means one comma two is between the roots. Sorry, one, one root is greater than two and other root is smaller than one. Sorry. I mispronounced it. Do it and let me know the result. Okay, Satyam again. Okay, fine. Let's check. Anybody else? Okay, Harshita. Just two people active today. Huh? Harshita and Satyam. Okay, chalo, we'll discuss it out quickly. So the first condition says discriminant should be greater than zero, right? Which clearly implies your M should be between minus infinity to one union nine to infinity. Correct. Second situation says A into F of K one should be less than zero. Correct. So here F of one should be less than zero, which basically gives you the shock when you realize that here itself, it is violated. That means this condition will never be true in your life. <laughs> that means here, here itself, the story is over. Problem solved. Answer is going to be no real values. 
is going to satisfy it. Is it fine? Any questions, any concerns? <laughs> I'll be telling in the last five minutes, no, not to worry. Okay, so we'll take the seventh uh, question also. Uh, why to leave that off? Seventh and eighth, we'll do it. This you will be solving it because with respect to theory, we have covered everything. Now, in this condition, you want at least one root to lie between one and two. At least one root to lie between one and two means what? At least one root to lie in the interval one and two means both roots lie between one and two. Sorry. Both roots lie between one and two and exactly one root lying between one two. Okay. So basically you have to take the union of the two conditions. So please do it and tell me the result because I think both the conditions we have already taken up. Both roots lying between one two was 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 Ah, option five. I mean, sub part five. Exactly one root was sub part four. Okay. So you basically have to take the overlapping condition of not overlapping union condition of four with five. Okay. So what was the overlapping condition of four with uh, what was the condition number four? <laughs> so I think four was M lying between 10 to infinity, right? Okay. And the fifth condition was, if I'm not mistaken, null set. Okay. So union of this will be union of this will be 10 to infinity. Is it fine? So even if your question is different from the theory that we have learned, you know that it can be basically built up by using the theory that we have already discussed. Okay. Let's take the last question for this academic year. Ant bhala to sab bhala. All well that ends well. So request everybody to get this right. At least one root is greater than two. Again, at least one root greater than two is made up of union of two cases, both roots greater than two. Okay. Or exactly one root greater than two. Exactly one root greater than two. That means two has to be between two has to be between the numbers. Okay. So here the situation is like this. I'm just making it both roots are greater than two means two is here. Okay. And this is a situation where two is between that's where exactly one will be greater than two. So basically it's a union of third and second, isn't it? Third is one root smaller than two other is greater than two. That's where two will come in between. And second is both roots are greater than two. So it's a union of second and third. So second and third, isn't it? So what was the second condition?
Yeah, second condition was M should be between nine to 10, right? If I'm not mistaken, check it out. And the third condition was M should be from 10 to infinity. So union will basically be nothing but nine to infinity, excluding 10. So this will be your answer to the question. Is it fine? All of you got it? Okay, great. So with this, we come to the happy conclusion of our class 11. But just to remind you, there are certain topics of class 11, which I'll be covering in 12th, especially when it comes to conic section, conic section, you have learned at a very shallow level. Uh, to go into the depth, I would engage you on certain Sundays. Okay. So we prepared to be called for one and a half hours class at least. Okay. Not more. I will not call you for three and a half hours, one and a half hours for certain Sundays. Okay. Maybe I would need around 10, 15 Sundays of your come upcoming academic year. Okay. Okay. So this is all with respect to our discussion of the topic.